Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Associate Professor Brett Lidbury, who holds positions at the National Centre for Epidemiology and Public Health at ANU College of Health and Medicine and the ANU College of Science. Um, he has expertise in medical um, virology and pathology, um, particularly in investigating genetic and pathology biomarkers of CFSME. Um, and today, He's going to be speaking to us um, about rethinking diagnostic reference intervals for MECFS via machine learning and the utility of Active and B to assess symptom severity. Welcome, Professor Lidbury. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. And um, it's a great event. I was saying uh, at lunchtime today, it's only, I've only been involved in research into MECFS for a few years. And it's been phenomenal. Um, I think when I started, it was I mean, it wasn't impossible, but it seemed unlikely that we could sort of draw such energy together to work on this uh, as a network. And really proud to be part of the uh, ME CSF Discovery Research Network, based here or out of Melbourne, although I'm based in Canberra. Um, just before I start, big thanks to Heidi and Danielle, of course, with Emerge and and team. Um, also, Paul Fisher. Uh, we had a lot to say. Uh, working with Heidi about the arrangements for this meeting. And in saying that, I must uh, admit that this session and the name of it was something I decided upon with knowing that Louis was coming, and thank you very much for making the long journey. Um, biobanking is something of great interest here, and that was not stimulated by me or any of the researchers, but by the Mason Foundation, who have, uh, with a couple of other foundations, have kept us Australian researchers afloat. Uh, and thanks to the Mason Foundation very much. And um, there is an initiative on hand, and um, I may have missed it, but I'm still waiting for the expression of interest call from the Mason Foundation. And I think, and we discussed this in December at our own uh, symposium before Christmas, about wouldn't it be good to at least start with a database? But I really think the biobank's the way to go. Um, the conclusion was, from the initial consultation with the research community and clinicians, was that you know, we really can't state a, a genuine standalone biobank because you need funding into posterity, you need, uh, you know, sustained support, and we can't guarantee that. But we can start, <laughs> and certainly having links with the UK will be a, a great advantage. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things, too, before I start. Uh, just to remind, Paul Fisher and I are co-editors on the special edition of Diagnostics, which will be published uh, in real... Well, with this uh, conference in mind, we'll be reporting the research presented, but there's also opportunities to present papers uh, freely, uh, uh, unsolicited, more or less, for consideration in that special edition of diagnostics, which will be completely focused on what comes out of this, uh, this uh, symposium and discussion that we're having. So anyway, on, on with the work. Um, it's an interesting one. I, I could have talked about a lot of things, but I think, again, with naming this session, biobanking and clinical data, that's where I think I can maybe work more productively today in sort of sitting back, thinking about not just how as a hardcore scientist we understand mechanism and we drill down and really understand what's going on, which is really important. And I am actually an experimentalist at heart. I, my PhD background is in virology and immunology. So a bit of an imposter with the machine learning world, but we'll, we'll see how we go with that. But um, there's a lot of things we could look at, but the one thing that comes out time and time again is, of course, education of medical and health professionals. And I suppose what I'm linking here today is some of the work we've done, uh, the patterns that we found using various pattern recognition machine learning, but also um, you know, the need to actually build the database and what we can do with that. Oh, yeah, I need to, of course, thank many, many people. And um, not everyone here will be continuing with this in CFS work, but certainly CFS discovery. and. If it wasn't for Don Lewis, I wouldn't be talking today or wouldn't be anywhere near Geelong today, in fact. Um, also had uh, some nice collaboration with David de Kretzer and um, the Hudson Institute on the Activan story, which I'll touch on today. But more thanks, of course. I've already mentioned the Ju uh, Judith J. Mason Foundation and the Equity Trustees. Um, the whole involvement that I have as a former virologist was a phone call from the, Al uh, from the Alison Hunter Memorial Foundation. Uh, Christine Hunter rang me and asked me if I'd be interested in talking to Don Lewis, and I said, yes, please, and uh, big thanks to Christine and her foundation as well, but also to Badia, Mark Hedger and others who were involved in the Activan work. And of course, the man himself, there we go, Don Lewis. Uh, I think a lot of us here wouldn't be uh, involved in this field without Don's 
patience, his generosity, um, his great insights. And of course, Edwina, we don't talk enough about Edwina. Um, she helps keep the whole, the whole operation afloat. And um, through thick and thin, Edwina's there and she rings up with the most direct, no-nonsense questions, um, really keeps you on your toes. But, uh, you know, again, Edwina is absolutely essential to this effort. And in fact, she, I did put her on the abstract as an author. So thanks, Edwina, and thank you, Don. So um, we're very lucky. Again, I, I, it's, an, it's an advertisement for the Mason Foundation, as it should be, actually. Um, we've just finished, and um, it's interesting hearing colleagues today saying, we'll turn the cameras off now and I'll talk later. Um, we have completed uh, our latest piece of work funded by the Mason Foundation, which was ostensibly about validating results to do with the cytokine active and B. And we're very excited from the work that was uh, the pilot studies that we did with Hunter Foundation funding to find a role or a, a marker, a blood serum marker that separated MECFS patients from healthy controls. So we put forward uh, an application which was fortunately funded to look at uh, validating with a larger cohort. It just turned out the cohort still wasn't large enough. And of course, elements of scale, I've talked a lot about just in conversations over cups of tea and, and uh, wine in the last 24 hours. So um, we're very lucky to get that funding, but I won't be talking necessarily about Active and B as a front and centre. It's just one of another of the growing list of cytokines. Uh, I agree with uh, what Travis said earlier with TGF beta, that seems very promising. Uh, interleukin 10 has been posited. There's a lot of, but we just can't quite nail it down. And the short story is um, we still can't quite nail down Active and B, although it was different again in the latest studies. So don't want to get too obsessed with that, um, but move into, as I said, areas which hopefully might be a bit more helpful in the day-to-day -day understanding of how we might uh, support patients with MECFS and support clinicians who work with the patients. So um, after hearing about all the Fisher stuff with proton channels and CD46 and all these you know, amazing molecular things. Um, I've thought of the analogy, it's something I learned when I studied statistics. Um, we move from the laser, so we're talking about the mitochondrial function, now we're more at the ax level. So you've got things that can separate uh, populations, but we, I'm using a much blunter instrument. But what we can bring to this sort of analysis is, uh, yeah, the machine learning type approaches, which I'll talk about in a moment. So, um, we used, again, recruited through CFS Discovery and Don Vale um, existing patients, so they were contacted by the clinic. Again, we had an enormous amount of trouble getting healthy controls, and it was just word of mouth, arm twisting, uh, just a whole range of ways. I even had some friends from where I live in northern Victoria come down for the day. It was that sort of... <laughs> and I volunteered as a healthy control. Um, like Louis said, what's healthy? I, maybe I'm not, but I did all right. So, um, but we're also very keen to get non-fatigue controls well, um, no luck there. We did a, approach a, a sleep centre, a sleep study centre, people who are fatigued due to lack of sleep or sleep apnea and other problems, but we just had no takers. So uh, one thing I will touch on today is while we've got 97 uh, research participants, it still isn't a perfect study. Um, some great news, though, was we did, um, in collaboration with Paul and his lab at La Trobe, um, we could use the same cohort that we used uh, for the mitochondrial study. So we now have a big database full of lovely results from the clinical type of data that Louis talked about right through to mitochondrial function and pathology tests and the rest. Um, with uh, South American colleagues, long story, you know, collaborating with uh, South America, but there's also some exome capture results on the boil, which I don't have yet. Um, so the sort of investigations, I'll just flick through this, but really to point out, of course, we really was, we were about this validation study on active and B. And what I'll be showing you today around these results is surprised me a little, but actually did point to a utility of active and B as a special cytokine potential marker, but in a different way than we normally think about it. So within that, we had orthostatic intolerance. So the, what we just call the standing test, absolutely essential to everything I'm about to talk about. It's a very, very simple technique, no tilt tables involved, just ask someone to stand up after lying down for five minutes. Now, there's a whole lot of ordinary data taken during this test as well by Don and Edwina. I won't be touching on that so much because we just haven't had time to look at it, essentially. 
Uh, the routine pathology is where I'm. The, <laughs> the routine pathology is where I'm really interested. I, um, I'm actually attached to the Royal College of Pathologists here in Australia, and I'm really, really interested in the efficacy of the sort of everyday sort of pathology data that we collect on patients, whether it's in the context of MECFS or other diseases. We can do more with this data. Uh, now, the 24-hour urine will come out of something interesting, and I think we'll link also with the CK observation that we just heard about, possibly. I'd like to open that up. Of course, mitochondrial function was done through Paul and the exome capture. And I must uh, thank the generosity of uh, ME Research UK for funding that part of the study. We're in Australia, they're in Scotland, and um, normally funding doesn't cross national boundaries. And I really uh, applaud them for just getting behind us. So that was really wonderful. Report's due at the end of this month, and I've got something to tell them, so I'm really happy with that. Now, just talking about the nature of the cohort that we studied, was um, we had 80 MECFS in the paltry 17 controls. Um, it's not a perfect study, as I've already mentioned. So all participants were recruited by Don and Edwina through CFS Discovery, clinicians who have many years of experience exclusively looking at people with ME and CFS. And we had essentially the breakdown, 4.7 in the CFS cohort, 4.7 women to one man, but only 2.43 women to one male in the control group. And there was a little bit of a disparity too with the age. So we couldn't exactly match controls, and we didn't have enough controls anyway, but the matching was a little bit awry, but you do the best you can. So that's what the cohort looked like. Um, so I put this slide in just simply to say that out of all of this, after hearing about the fancy mitochondrial biochemistry, uh, the NK cell function and the rest, which is really, really important, how can we you know, reflect that in day-to-day -day data? So the pathology results are a big problem in terms of the traditional view of how we look at pathology results. You turn up, in fact, I'll go to the next slide already, then I'll go backwards. Uh, this is, these are results from an earlier study and basically nothing significant. So we have the situation where Again, going back to the orthostatic intolerance testing, the standing time and the difficulty were highly significant between healthy controls and MECFS participants. I mean, people with MECFS had trouble, or if they could stand the full 20 minutes, they had difficulty doing so. And it was black and white. Yet the pathology data showed no significant differences. Just a little bit of tantalisation around bilirubin, which was probably Gilbert syndrome, and um, the insulin uh, in a GTT, a glucose tolerance test. So what are we faced with? And I, I can't speak for the United States, the UK or any other advanced economy or country, but um, we have the issue with pathology reference intervals. We have the issue too with, in this country, 10 to 20 minute medicine. So you're sick, you present to your GP, all right. Now, I haven't read the current Australian guidelines, but very good, uh, reliable people tell me they're completely out of date and inadequate. Would that be fair to say? Yep. <laughs> yeah, they are. Uh, they were published in 2002, and a lot's happened since then, thankfully. It's time to get on with it. Um, the sort of thing we're, we're finding, just talking to patients, is that uh, there's a consensus just out there in GP land that we actually have a treatment for MECFS in the form of graded exercise therapy. And that's apparently what the guidelines suggest. So a bit of work to do there. And of course, the worst thing you can do is say, oh, it's all in your head. And how many people have I spoken to who have, set, have been brushed off by naughty uh, health professionals? First, do no harm. So if you can't help them, just say so. Don't sort of humiliate them. So that all leads, of course, to an unsatisfactory patient experience. So how can I, as a researcher, help with that? I'm not sure that I can, but we can at least try. Now, just... Um, <laughs> it will be death by uh, tables during my talk, but I do put little little things in to help guide you through it. Now this slide is just basically a comparison of a number of features of the, uh, the cohort that was collected for the study I just introduced. Uh, we, um, I, I spend a lot of time with statisticians and I realise as a classically trained biologist, biologists are really bad at statistics and it's been terrific to actually um, work with Alice Richardson who will be here tomorrow. Um, who's a PhD in, statist in statistics to actually knock me around the head a bit and wake me up and do things as good as I can. Uh, the KS statistic um, is a way of actually judging whether your data follows a normal distribution or not. 
and generally speaking, without going into all the highbrow statistics, uh, the data presented both in the participant MECFS group and the healthy controls um, were, were not distributed in a normal bell-shaped curve. So they were not normally distributed, meaning that I'm reporting here medians and uh, percentiles, not means and standard deviations. So that was uh, the case for most of the data. Except for age, age actually did follow a normal distribution, as one would expect. So we actually look closely to make sure we're doing the best stats. Now, the other thing I want to put up here is um, that we use the DAS scale, or that's Don and Edwina. Yep, worth sleep scale. Wasn't a lot going on with the sleepiness, um, but we can tease that out a bit more. But the DAS scale, so that's depression, anxiety and stress, uh, went through the roof. So all the people in the MECFS, whether they were mild or severe, uh, reported much higher levels of uh, total depression, anxiety and or stress. Um, I won't break it down by condition, but that was something that really stood out very clearly in that cohort. And there's Alice, who again you'll meet tomorrow. Um, now the next thing we need to introduce is we've got an idea about the study and what we're looking to achieve. Now the next thing is, um, thanks to Alice, and Paul's already mentioned this generously this morning, about the weighted standing time. Uh, this work's been published and there's a link there if you'd like it or if you want to talk to me later I can give you the PDF. Uh, this was published uh, actually last year in the Journal of Translational Medicine, which has been a great friend to MECFS researchers. Uh, they ask you to review papers in return, but that's fine. So um, Alice's idea was, um, of course, we were dealing with patients and now research participants who came to CFS Discovery who could actually attend the clinic. All right. Now, the majority of them could actually stand for the full 20 minutes, albeit with more difficulty in general, not always. So the weighted standing time is just a way to actually, as the name suggests, weight the standing time by the difficulty and come up with a scale by which to judge severity. Again, Paul mentioned it this morning. Is it a proxy for MECFS severity or a true measure? Um, I'll leave that to others to discuss and argue and debate. Um, people always say, oh, other things you know, will cause that, heart function, whatever. But I think if you've got people who have fulfilled you know, the first couple of things in the clinical criteria, unexplained fatigue for six months, payback or post-exertional malaise, and they can't stand properly or they have orthostatic intolerance, maybe there's something there that, again, will help day to day. So there are various categories, and these tables are presented in the, the publications from this work, uh, again, that I can share. But um, essentially, look, I can't leave the podium. I was going to go over and walk around. So category zero are mild, oh, sorry, I'll start again. Category zero are the healthy controls. Category one, mild uh, MECFS, two moderate and three severe. What are the definitions? They're healthy controls, all right. They were recruited as healthy controls. They all stood 20 minutes at low difficulty. The mild severity all stood 20 minutes. And again, the difficulty overlap wasn't much. But you see here for the moderates, and you can see the numbers in each um, strata of the uh, of the cohort here. So, um, but once you get up to here, to moderate, moderate severity, all stood 20 minutes, but at a difficulty from uh, above, or from four to 9.5. And the severe cases, they had uh, WST, which was very low, and none of them could actually complete the 20 minute standing time. And of course, they all had quite severe difficulty. So they, the severe people were judged in this case as people couldn't complete the 20 minute standing test. And that was developed by Don and Ed Weiner in their clinic. And we have now taken hold of that to do something with it in the research. Now, the next thing I've got to say is for the next analyses, um, and this is just purely a statistical sample size problem, is I actually combined uh, category zero and one together for the following analyses, simply because uh, by keeping four categories, I just didn't have the correct, even with machine learning, the appropriate amount of statistical power to actually run the analyses, and the models were just useless. So a little bit of... Uh, creative licence had to be applied. And this is what it looks like, and I've realised since that the, I've been squinting at a few talks today, and you can have to squint at mine, I'm afraid. So a random forest. Um, this isn't a lesson on machine learning, although I know Travis is keen to talk later on. But because of the sample size, uh, the, the, a number of different machine learning approaches, or, or think about AI. The media talks about AI. They're coming to take our jobs, right? So machine learning is part of that, artificial intelligence. You train and test models. And I'm not going to go on about that much today. But what we can do, um, 
with a large data set is apply a number of different types of algorithms to data to actually separate complex data from each other and actually help make decisions about it. Now, um, with a fairly small sample size, 97 in this case, um, I decided to use random forest because uh, rather than using just a single decision tree, you can run 5,000 trees in an interview process where you can actually then generate a set of predictors based on a, what's called a Gini index, which is used to measure income inequality, and it's been applied to this algorithm, and a permutation model. There's some maths behind this. If you're interested, I'll give you the paper later on. But basically, what came out at the top uh, was uh, creatinine excretion. So this is from the urine. We collected from our participants a 24-hour urine sample. Not all of them complied, but we got enough uh, to do some studies, and their excretion rate over 24 hours came out on top. Uh, alkaline phosphatase, and there's our friend active, uh, active and B, uh, the first appointment, so the baseline amount. Then we've got the uh, red cell indice MCH, means corpuscular haemoglobin, blood urea nitrogen, and blood lymphocytes, and roughly the same. And with these models, we can also look at accuracy. So we could actually separate uh, the three categories, the healthy and mild cases from the moderate from the severe, and uh, a prediction error of around 38%. So we had about 62% where we were actually able, with these rules, actually separate uh, the, the cohorts, the mild uh, healthy through the moderate through the severe. Um, now, the other thing, if you're feeling really uh, motivated, is you can run these types of algorithms as, as, as ensembles. And ensemble comes from the Latin, or French, meaning together. So you run lots and lots of these things. So you run 5,000, then you run it again 5,000 times, and you just keep going. Uh, we ran, for this, about 100 iterations of a, a range of type of machine learning algorithms. And the random forest, again, just fortunately actually came out on top. But you can see, if you look up here at the scale, we, we didn't actually, particularly for the kappa value, but we didn't actually increase the accuracy much by even running it further. So we're pretty much at the extent uh, based on the amount of data we had and what we could do with how much we could interpret from that. So we did try that as well. So did we, we tried to enhance the model performance by running it I mean, more deeply into uh, the data and using what's called a boosting strategy. People in machine learning are obsessed with things like boosting and bagging, different ways of actually resampling data to help solve the problem of either missing data or insufficient data. Now, this is the same thing, but this is now just looking at separating, using the weighted standing time that I've introduced to separate the uh, mild or uh, healthy cohort from the moderates. And again, we, we found active and B slipped up the scale. So at the top, you can see the points to the right. That indicates uh, greater strength in the predictive model that we're producing. So active and B actually slipped up the scale, and we've got the other characters, and again, creatinine excretion over 24 hours uh, stayed at the top. But just to move forward a bit, um, one thing that's good in the, the, the sort of machine learning we were using is thanks to the development of some new tools, it's called CARAT, it's an acronym, uh, we can actually tune our models and do a little bit more. Now, uh, normally an ROC or a, a receiver operating characteristic, which is just a fancy term for balancing the true positives, true negatives, false positives, etc. Uh, it's usually done just between um, single analytes, but we have a way now with Random Forest to run the whole uh, gamut of the six markers together as an ROC. And we actually found it was quite nice um, by those markers that were identified by Random Forest to run the ROC and, and find that we got uh, this area under curve just indicates how well it was predicting or separating the, um, the different categories, zero from one. So the healthy, mild cases from the moderate MECFS cases. Again, not absolutely ideal because I had to combine the healthy controls with the mild people. So I've just got to put that out there. So the area under curves is a fancy calculation to look at how well you're separating the two cohorts both based on the, on the uh, test that you, the results that you have. And also I use the... Um, I use the random forest also to predict. So you can actually run a predict function on this data and find which cases actually were predicted correctly by the algorithm. Pretty scary? Yes, a little bit. Um, but nonetheless, in this context, very, very useful. Um, for example, uh, the error rate dropped to 6.9%. Now, this is a model I purposely tilted towards 
positive outcome. So these are cases that were positively predicted in the earlier experiments with random forests, and I selected only the cases that were predicted correctly out of uh, 0, 1, 2 and 3, so across the WST spectrum that I've mentioned, and we can reduce the error rate down to below 10 per cent. And what was interesting is while we got an error rate of 8.7 per cent for the zero category of WST, the moderate one, uh, actually there was no error at all, but you can see 17 per cent was the error at predicting cases uh, of severe uh, under the WST uh, weighted standing time regime, which um, basically, to cut a long story short, was a feature of the whole research program. Predicting the severe cases using these algorithms was always difficult. But fortunately, and maybe fortunately in the clinical sense, these tools are really good at picking up maybe mild to moderate cases. And ActiveMV actually enhances that prediction just a little bit. So and that's the rock curve. So we went from that 0.755 to 0.963. Uh, again, by me choosing the cases that were correctly predicted. And even so, we still have a small error, <laughs> of course, as indicated by the previous slide as well. So we do have this issue of predicting who is sick and who's not. But basically what I'm saying is the model, based on the ALP, the creatinine clearance, uh, the active and B, et cetera, uh, work pretty well at separating them. And uh, of course, we need much more data to get a, a decent algorithm that can be used clinically. And that's really the nub of the talk, is we need a database. Now, um, no need to absorb this. Again, it's been published, but um, this sort of data here, what I tried to do with the correctly predicted cases after random forest analyses was to actually work out using the percentiles a, ref a new reference interval. And uh, I know the next, uh, next activity on the agenda is a trip to taste wine, so I will try and be as quick as I can. So I won't hold people up. Is that all right? <laughs> But um, essentially, out of all of this, um, to boil it down, what I found was it was actually, and again, maybe with the CK markers, Louis, it might be useful. Uh, most of the uh, conf confidence intervals that I calculated, 25 to 70 percent, 25 to 75% percentiles, uh, it was only the 24-hour uh, uh, urinary creatinine excretion rate that actually had intervals that didn't actually overlap. Most of them were overlapping, but these ones actually stood, stood side by side. Now, active and B also was still quite significant, which was good to see. But I was looking to actually now, and this is the number of the presentation, actually calculate new reference intervals based on this approach with random forest. So rather than walking in and saying nothing's in the reference interval, to actually produce a new way of using reference intervals. Now, the... Um, I'll just raise this briefly to, um, oh yeah, this is just briefly to say that's pre-class prediction. So that's what, what happened before I did the actual prediction of which, were, uh, which cases were correctly predicted. Active and B was still um, significant, as was uh, urinary creatinine excretion. Just going on a little bit more. Now, the gist of this slide is simply looking at the same markers but um, we we're finding some pretty crazy things amongst, say, serum urea, which makes some sense in terms of the creatinine result. But um, what I did, like a good statistician should, was think differently and ran two types of non-parametric tests. So the Crux, Crux School Wallace was run to look at any variation across the three classes, but also the Yonkara Terpstra test was ran and um, compared. So that's what A and B means. They're two different significance based on two different tests for Two, or more than two categories, non-parametrically. And um, again, we found the urinary creatinine excretion rate over 24 hours in active and B actually fulfilled or maintained significance for both those tests, but also serum urea. So I was just a little bit more stringent in looking at the statistical testing where other things that came up significant, say MCH, uh, the red cell marker, uh, was significant with Kruskal Wallace, but not with the other statistical tests. So just trying to put a little bit more rigour into that. Now, I've just got to flag this. Um, I did allude to earlier the problem with age. We couldn't get age cr uh, matched correctly, um, unfortunately. And it seems like the WST2, so this is the people with, uh, we judge as with moderate symptoms as, as calculated from the orthostatic intolerance or the standing test, we had them way out of sync. The average age there was 55 compared to early to mid 40s. 
for the other categories. So uh, whether that means anything clinically, I'm not sure, but we had this issue with the moderate people. So the conclusions are um, we can use random forest machine learning as a powerful tool to revisit and rethink uh, very, very basic data that GPs and everyday clinicians will be exposed to and will use in their everyday practice. And what I'd like to propose is that we maybe think about that and uh, propose, rather than just going by the standard laboratory reference intervals, that we start calculating some specific intervals to help uh, particularly GPs screen potential patients in the 10 to 20 minutes that they have. And maybe just ask them to stand up for a few minutes as well, as Donna suggested, and see how they go. Um, we don't expect suburban GPs to, or rural GPs to do a full two to three hour workup, but at least they can screen and at least maybe uh, after an initial consultation, point them to someone like Don and others who can actually dig deeper on whether they've got CFS. Um, top rank predictor was the 24 hour creatinine. And um, when you think about it, it's a nitrogenous waste product. It's probably maybe just due to the fact that people are more sedentary. I don't know if we can read too much into that, but I'll leave that to the metabolomics gurus to discuss further. So I'm not saying it's going to be a perfect marker. And uh, we have, of course, calculated some new reference intervals. Active and B was excellent. There's a whole new, an extra seminar I could present on Active and B and Active and Family generally, but it was actually very useful. Uh, apart from its primary function as a, a potential biomarker to help discriminate between uh, mild symptoms and moderate symptoms of MECFS in our, in our um, hands and reform, as I've said, reformulate the reference ranges to help busy clinicians. And why this session? Oh, I've already touched on this. We need large patient databases and let's collaborate and start pulling this data together so we can run these types of algorithms through not tens but through thousands and maybe tens of thousands of cases and uh, assist with decision to support and actually develop some uh, worthwhile rules based on machine learning. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Brett. I guess we probably have time for about one question, is that right, <laughs> before the wine begins? Uh, people are thirsty, I think. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Did you find a reason for why the severe, the severe end of the, the data, you, it was greater error than the moderate group? Did, did I basically have no idea, but I could pass it over to some of the treating <laughs> physicians and medical practitioners. Um, I, I think the things we're looking at was, you know, you've got essentially data which is all within the reference interval, um, you know, just at first look. Um, and our definition of severe, of course, I think we're capturing that at some level, but I think for a small sample size, the diversity and, you know, in that group is just a little bit hard to capture. But I seriously don't know how to answer that <laughs> question. But, but thanks for asking. Happy to take questions later. And talk over wine or things. Thank you. Thank you everyone uh, for this afternoon. Um, we are going to go on the excursion for everyone that's booked on the excursion. There are plenty of places if you haven't booked on and you'd like to join us, they've sent us the big coach. Um, so um, if you'd like to join us for the trip to the winery and then for dinner, we'll get back to the Novotel about 9 p.m. tonight. Uh, pretty quick turnaround now for everyone that's going on the excursion. Quick run to your room, put your things down and then onto the bus and we'll head out. Thank you, see you, see you in a bit.